we explored Dante and the Divine Feminine in another talk. An obvious thing to do given the extraordinary part that Beatrice plays in Dante's journey through the Divine Comedy and across the domains of the Inferno, the Purgatory and the Paradise. She is nothing less than Christ to him. But given what is revealed to Dante as he deepens his contact, his participation, his understanding and love of reality, is that all beings share in the one divine being in their multiple manifestations, like as many beams of light across the cosmos. It makes sense too to ask about Dante and the divine masculine, how these qualities that we call masculine qualities also reflect the one divine light. We're thinking in a way about masculine archetypes again, but using this word archetypes carefully as indicators, as patterns that aren't fixed in creation, but form perhaps like shadows moving in the constant play of love and light, echoing and bounding around the cosmos as Dante finally describes it. So not in a literal way, um, but as a way of deepening our discernment, our understanding of our connection both with ourselves, with the world around us, with others, and ultimately with the divine. It's a useful way, much like understanding the divine feminine illuminates and expands our sense of contact with God. And much as I did with the divine feminine, thinking about it in negative as well as positive forms, important because in Dante, the negative is always a precursor to the about turn that leads to the positive understanding and realization of God. It's the parallel that you find in Jung with his concept of anantiadromia, the about turn, the descent that leads to the ascent. So too, the same can be done with the manifestations of masculinity that Dante encounters as he makes his journey. The negative forms are obvious and manifold, particularly in the Inferno, of course. The first people that he meets in the antechamber of hell are those who are drifting now in the afterlife because they drifted through their mortal lives. They couldn't make any decisions, couldn't decide how to live their lives at all. And so in eternity, just follow mindlessly the crowd. Um, led by someone raising a banner that's moderately meaningless and they're attacked by bugs. Um, they get preoccupied, you might say, with the little details of life, um, become obsessed with that which really shouldn't matter at all. They're the individuals that lacked the qualities often associated with masculinity, which would be the aggression that can actually decide how to live your life how to make decisions, how to turn this way and not that. As Dante enters the Inferno proper, he quickly comes across, for example, in the fifth circle, the men who are angry, who are raging against themselves and are stuck in the mud of the murky rivers of hell, as well as those who have projected their anger onto other men and constantly attack each other in cycles that have no end and have no meaning. And then, Deeper down, once they've got through the city of Dis, Dante discovers what in modern psychotherapy might be called the phallic narcissists, those who wave their power solely to attack others and to, in their delusion, feel they're attacking gods. There's the figure of Caponaeus who's sitting up on the burning sands and feeling he's blaspheming the divine and not even realising that his blasphemies are bolts of lightning and outpourings of fire on himself, generated by himself. And then there's figures like Farinata, who sits up and is so preoccupied with the battles that he fought on earth that he barely even realises that he's died and is in a different domain. These multiple forms of what would be called phallic narcissism are evident throughout the Inferno. And if they have one quality in common, it would be an inability to connect with life. 
which gives us a clue as to what masculinity is therefore about. And I want to explore that now in its more positive forms by thinking about four ways in which masculinity in this archetypal discussion is often characterised in relation to the figures of the warrior, the magician, the lover and the king because they do make sense of many of the people that Dante encounters in the most important moments across the Divine Comedy. So think about the warrior first. Um, clearly in the more spiritual form this is not about someone who attacks others but you might say kind of attacks life, wants the most out of life and is prepared to put their own life on the line in order to do that. One of the great manifestations of this archetype in world literature would be Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, who on the eve of a great battle realises that he's been fighting the wrong kinds of battles, defeating his enemies, who he starts to realise are also his kin, his brothers. And so through his vision with Krishna, realises that there's an inner battle that he must embark upon now. And the figure who in a way does this for Dante is his relative, his great-great-great-grandfather, Caccia Guida, who he meets in paradise. He was a crusader in the generations before Dante and also lived in Florence's heyday when it was still flush with its youthful idealism and optimism, when it was the burgeoning new city of Italy and so was in good contact with its wellspring, with its source and so manifested the virtues of its life much more than the vices which had become dominant in Dante's own time when Dante felt that Florence was spiralling down in fact. And so meeting Caccio Aguida is to be in contact with this masculine energy that knows how to embark on life in pursuit of what's good rather than in pursuit of what's degenerate or corrupt. But it's nuanced, as always is the case, because Caccio Aguida, it seems, in his own life had to himself battle with the degenerate types of this warrior energy. So he was a crusader, he went on the Crusades and died in fact whilst crusading but of course the Crusades themselves unleashed mixed energies in relation to this warrior impulse in particular atrocities were perpetrated and also people sacrificed themselves in masochistic ways as if just going through the suffering of the Crusades would somehow save them but it seems that Caccio Guida managed to embody and realise in his life before he died the warrior energy that teaches about self-sacrifice, about how to disidentify with oneself in order to awaken to the true nature of oneself, which of course is to realise that your finite being is a reflection of the infinite being. And so that gives us an important clue as to what this warrior energy is about in the biggest sense, as Arjuna discovers it's the battle to become unattached with what's happening in life moment by moment in order to become aware of one's participation with the flow of life itself, with the divine itself. This is what Krishna tries to show Arjuna on the eve of battle. And Kachua Guida seems to have achieved something similar so that when he talks with Dante in the heaven of Mars, Dante can reconnect again with the virtuous currents that his great-great-great-grandfather had embodied and so reconnect with that in spite of all the vices and degeneracy and distress in fact that he feels about the Florence of his own day. It reconnects him to the good impulse. This mix found in the Crusader energy shows up in the second of these common ways of talking about the masculine archetype, that of the magician. And the person who I feel exemplifies that to Dante is that of Bernard, who he meets right at the end of the paradise. And Bernard comes to my mind partly because he was the figure that preached the Second Crusade and so knew of the degenerate forms of the magician's energy, the one who can manipulate others by their words and send them on these very mixed undertakings 
And Bernard was also a great religious reformer, a kind of puritanical figure, often it feels. And so he also had the other kind of degenerate form of the magician's energy, which is that of the innocent, the one who's actually unconnected with life. If the manipulative side of the magician's energy is to become too immersed in the politicking of the day, the reverse of that is to be completely clear and imagine you're above that participation in life and so present yourself as innocent. But by being aware of these opposite streams, having known them directly, Bernard also discovers the true energy of the masculine magician and shows that to Dante in the paradise because he's the one who knows how to make the last move that would step into the full conscious awareness of divine participation. He shows Dante in the Imperium how to open himself up to the love that moves with the sun and the other stars. By this paradoxical process of owning all you are so that you can let go of all you are. That, you might say, is the spell that Dante has to discover, the magic that Dante has to discover in order to connect with that which enchants and vitalizes and inspirits all things. And Bernard utters this prayer at the end of the paradise, which is a bit like a spell that carries Dante into this final part of his journey so that he then afterwards feels the divine grace and the divine light flooding into him. Bernard helps him to do that. The third way in which the masculine archetype is often talked about is in relation to the lover. And again, Dante meets lesser forms of this archetype in various figures. For example, low on Mount Purgatory, he comes across his friend Balacqua, who had loved life, but in a lazy, lounging kind of way. And when he encounters him on Mount Purgatory, he's sort of flopping around on the ground, not quite sure how to hoik himself up and let his desire draw him up the early slopes, the lower slopes of the mountain. He's a perfectly nice chap to meet. Dante and Balacqua have a warm encounter, but his lover's desire hasn't yet gained the impetus to help him to begin the journey of the afterlife. And if that's a kind of impotent love in the masculine form, he also meets a figure that manifests the profligate version of that. This would be the troubadour Sordello, who spent his life praising love, making his living out of singing the praises, but perhaps not quite knowing what that energy was himself. And so now, a little further up Mount Purgatory from Balacqua, he is learning to focus and tune that energy and desire, that lover's passion, aright. But the person that Dante meets who has got that aright is the figure of Statius. Further up Mount Purgatory, Virgil and Dante meet him having stood upright, having done his time on Mount Purgatory, so understanding the complexities of himself in order that he can progress into the heavenly realms. You might say that Statius is lover energy now knows how not only to see and want beauty but to pursue it to enter into it completely and the way this is to, this is conveyed in the divine comedy is that status explains that during the time in which he lived which was the first century a.d although he was born a roman pagan he witnessed the earliest christians and so secretly started to follow this new dispensation he you might say, woke to the new beauty, the new love that was being titrated into creation with the birth of Christ. And so was able to orientate his life around that as a full incarnation, embodiment of the masculine archetype of the lover. So we've talked about the warrior, we've talked about the magician, we've talked about the lover. And the fourth is the king, the mature version of the divine child. And the figure that Dante encounters that clearly exemplifies this is actually the figure of Adam. He meets Adam in the very high heavens and Adam is such a fascinating figure to meet because he is the aboriginal human, humanity created in the form of unmediated access to the divine. When Adam was in Eden 
even before Eve was made out of Adam's side, Adam was able to know God directly, to feel the flow of the divine spirit through him, even as the wind moved across the trees and flowers of Eden. And Adam explains some of his journey from his creation as this divine child to being sovereign of himself now in paradise by explaining something of the nature of the fall to Dante. It's the fall that's a rupture that Dante learns is the necessary move in order to become adult, to mature, to become a self, to become the kind of individual who can say of themselves, I am, and so reflect consciously and fully the divine I am. In paradise, the fall is not an error, it's not a mistake. Beatrice calls it a digression because it's part of the return that brings all of creation to God, complete with all its potential realised. One way that Adam does this is by talking about the nature of language, which of course is always interesting given that Dante was a poet. And Adam says that when he was created as the divine child, language came spontaneously to him. It was like breathing. No thought was required, no struggle was required, no inventiveness was required, but also no co-creativity was required. And that whilst the fall was devastating and the sense of expulsion and alienation was overwhelming, in time this descent becomes an ascent because he learns to co-create with Eve in their words, in the new language that they struggle and wrestle to speak but meaning that they now share in the divine life as fully formed divine creations, as beings knowingly participating and reflecting in the divine being. So that sense of movement from the divine child to being sovereign of yourself, being the archetype of the king, requires this wound, requires this fall, in order to become a complete speaker of divine life. Incidentally, there's an interesting contrast with Adam's kingly energy and kings that Dante meets earlier on Mount Purgatory who are sitting in a very beautiful valley that's a bit Eden-like but aren't able to share in its life. They seem kind of nonchalant, a bit depressed now you might say. They are still feeling the alienation and haven't yet learned to speak the language of paradise and so see the beauty and the life that's all around them. Adam though has and in some ways you can see how his self sovereignty brings together the other archetypes associated with this masculine energy. Um, he has fought his way back to the divine in a sense. He has followed the line of beauty and so learnt about the reception of grace as the magician knows and has kept his passion and love alive, not let himself fall eternally into a depressive state um, that would spiral down rather than lift him up. So that's to say something about the masculine divine and complement earlier thoughts on the feminine divine. But I wanted to add just a couple of other reflections by way of concluding. One is that when these energies, be they masculine or feminine, lift individuals back towards the divine, they do with a certain quality of threeness. Let me explain by way of contrast with the figures that Dante had met in the Inferno, who had these negative forms of masculinity that were entrapping them. They live in a binary world, which is just about they and themselves, be it their inability to stop the fights that consumes them in life. They live in a kind of flat land where they can't see anything more than their preoccupations and this male aggression, this male energy becomes completely caught up in that. But the figures who Dante meets on Purgatory, figures like Balacqua and Sordello, and certainly Statius further up Mount Purgatory, they have learnt that their energy, both masculine and in fact feminine, because of course these things come together in all of us, whatever our starting point is, open up a third dimension so that you might say this kind of who you are, the energy that you're learning to focus and to cultivate that leads you into a more expansive sense of reality, that leads you towards the divine. And in the comedy, this is often actually shown literally when Dante and, say, Virgil meet Statius, they become a three and travel together. 
and represent different aspects of this three-dimensional world to each other, which in their conversation opens up more and more. You know, Dante is the figure making the journey into the afterlife for the first time. Virgil is the figure making a journey into new parts of the afterlife that he'd not encountered before. And Statius is the figure who can lead them both because he has put the time into Mount Purgatory, understands himself and so can stand and continue the journey towards the paradise. Three show up in all sorts of ways in the paradise too. There's now Dante and Beatrice, of course, journeying together, but then they meet these various figures who open aspects of celestial life to Dante. Figures like Cacio Guida and figures like Picarda, who I mentioned previously when talking about the Divine Feminine. So that seems to be a really important clue about how to cultivate these energies. Always ask yourself, is this leading to more as opposed to turning in on itself? Is it leading to a sense of three and four and more dimensions in life, the soul expanding? as one becomes less and less identified with a narrow sense of self, a finite self, um, the lost self that actually becomes preoccupied and tends to spiral down. This offers an important insight, I think, into the notion of hierarchies as well. Um, hierarchies tend to get a bad press in the modern world, particularly when talking about the masculine and the feminine as forms of structure that oppress, that keep people down, which of course they do. But in the Divine Comedy, hierarchies are actually seen, well, in the original sense of the word, which comes from two Greek words, Hierophant, who's the initiate, who knows the path to the divine, and the Arche, which is the source, the ground, the being itself that the initiate knows and so can lead you to. And so hierarchies in this divine sense are that which shower divine grace down onto the world and lift us up through them in order that we might know God. Beatrice, you might say, is the queen of the hierarchies. She leads Dante through the heavenly hierarchies. And you can see how in her, all these aspects, both of the feminine and the masculine, are working in a beautiful synthesis in order to travel through and more deeply into these aspects of reality. She has Carly's energy that knows when to be aggressive towards Dante. She has Mary's energy that knows how to say yes to more life. She has Lilith's energy that knows the ecstasy that's actually an awakening, not just a blasting with divine light. And she also has Sophia's wisdom, which we talked about in relation to the divine feminine, that has the capacity to discern, to articulate with conscious intelligence what's going on but also knows when to step back in order to allow the divine life to touch Dante unmediated. But she also has these masculine qualities. Her Kali energy is also a kind of warrior energy. Her Sophia is also that of the magician that knows how to break reality open. And of course she also has the lover's energy that's not preoccupied with the beloved as Dante was originally, but realizes that that first love is itself an initiation to be able to travel the lines of love and light back to the divine. She's a wonderful example of how the masculine and the feminine can weave together. And so it completely makes sense that she is the person who reached down to Dante when he was first lost midway through the course of his life and found himself wandering in the dark, empty forest but also meets him at the top of Mount Purgatory to lift him into paradise and guide him right to the heart of the Imperium. And the point where Dante himself, now fully formed too, can share in the divine life unalloyed.